um, I, I, I'm, I'm excited about today. Uh, I am excited, and I am also um, humbled and, quite frankly, scared to death. And when I say scared to death, I mean just that. I am scared to death. I've been scared into silence. I've been scared into retreat. I have withdrawn from friends. I've withdrawn from my wife. Um, and I'm excited at the same time for a couple of reasons. Uh, next week, I will not be here. Mr. Norton, I hope, will be filling in for me next week doing introductions. We gave him a uh, we gave him a trial run last week, and uh, he kind of messed it up because he forgot to give us a prayer. But uh, I'm going to give him a chance to redeem himself this morning. But, guys, I want to spend just a minute and tell you about a friend of mine, my very first friend, the guy I grew up across the street from. His name is Max Tullis. He used to sit in this seat right here, and he was a member of the coffee team. Thursday morning was very special to Max. Thursday was his favorite day of the week because he came to men's round table. He went into work and he took the afternoon off and he played golf with his buddies and he lived life in a large way. Um, Max was one of the kindest guys I know or knew. Um, he died a death of cancer, but he died in such a gracious fashion and led life in the last couple of years of his life in a way that would just unbelievable to me and to those that were around him. Um, there's a note that's uh, written here, uh, and you see Lodi Locks is, uh, is his daughter. Max spent the last weekend of his life writing notes to family members, loved ones, and people that he knew he had impacted and whose lives were going to be touched severely by his passing. And this note was delivered to his daughter two months later at Valentine's. And he wrote notes to other family members. And his wife just shared with me that he would, um, that some of those would, would, would be revealed later in time at an appropriate time. <laughs> I can imagine that the time his daughter may be married or his son gets married or birth of a child. And his wife asked, you know, honey, can, can, can you write a note to me? I wish you'd write a note to me. And that was the last note he worked on. And he struggled with it. And Karen said she knew he struggled because he couldn't remember or he couldn't come to grips if he should write it in present tense or past tense. And he never completed the note because he didn't know how to write it. But he died on a Sunday morning and just before passing made a motion. I'll see you over the hill. I'll see you on the other side. I'll be there on the other side. I'll be waiting for you when you get there. Um, next week I'll be gone. A group of us, uh, go to South Dakota pheasant hunting in his memory every year. Um, uh, we have a fellow that joined us. Uh, it's not been the last three years because he's been battling brain cancer. Um, but guys, I come to you this morning because the importance of another brother, Tim Atkinson, um, many of you in this room do not know Tim. Tim is an alumni of deer camp and longtime friend. He does not live here. He lives in South Haven. Um, I knew Tim uh, from years ago when, when we went to deer camp and, and went to Monday morning meetings afterwards. Tim was very lost. He was confused. He was struggling. He was trying to find a way in the darkness and he was looking for light. He was looking for a life partner. He was looking for somebody to share life with. And he met Denise. And uh, they have been married a few years. I don't know exactly how many, but I know they've been married a few years. And by watching Tim's post on Facebook over the last couple of years, Tim has been really excited about life. And he's been thrilled by it. And six, eight weeks ago, he was a complete picture of perfect health and was diagnosed two weeks ago with pancreatic cancer. I don't know of two words that can be put together that are any more scary than cancer and pancreatic. Um, but Tim sent out a request by email of what Phil refers to from the movie, We Were Soldiers, Broken Arrow. And Tim made a plea for the guys of Deer Camp, the alumni, and uh, I'm extending that to this Thursday morning group to pray for he and his wife and the medical staff and the team. Guys, I, I love being here. I love being a part of this group. It's important to me. It's important to my family. 
if you don't have somebody in this room, if there is there somebody in this room that does not have somebody that they can call in a broken arrow situation, go to deer camp. If there is somebody in this room that cannot pick up the phone and call somebody as Joseph Pettit did to me Saturday, two weeks ago, after a young man committed suicide, <laughs> having no idea what to do. Guys, we're all going to die. We're all going to die. Whether it's shooting in Las Vegas, God forbid it's a suicide and you leave your family. If it's to cancer or if it's to natural death as a doctor friend of mine died three funerals last week. And I was sitting in that funeral with um, good friends, Joseph and David Goodwin, and reminded, it's not how we die, it's how we live. And that's what this is about. This is what Thursday morning is about, is teaching men <laughs> how to live. I don't want us to forget that message. Phil is a gifted speaker. He brings uh, the Bible and God's word to us in a way that I've never seen, never experienced. He brings it to life in a way that I can relate to. And I thank you so much for doing that, Phil. There's somebody else in this room that, that is incredible to me, and that's John Norton. John offers prayer in a way that I have never experienced from any preacher, from any layperson, from anybody. And I told John that last week, and he missed his opportunity to pray for us last week. And I've asked John if he would please come this morning, give you an opportunity to knock the rust off, get the prayer right, <laughs> before you do it next week, but if you would, please. Uh, I will. And I'll be back next week. I'm thinking of a song to sing. Joe doesn't sing for you guys. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> no, uh, thank you guys for coming. I, um, uh, was thinking it was, you talking about Max. I, it, when, when we had the funeral, for, they had the funeral for Max at the Catholic church downtown. He put it on the back of it. His family did about the men's round table. And it was, the, it was, I think through the men's round table that really had led him to the Lord. So I don't pray for Tim and I got a buddy too named uh, Max Yates. Uh, and uh, so let's pray. Dear Lord, we just come to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for this new day that you've given us Lord to walk in your mercies and your grace. Uh, we just, uh, Lord, want to walk today in strength and victory and enjoy the day that you've given us. We don't want to walk uh, way down with the burdens of our uh, life and sin. And so we, uh, we invite you, Lord, here this day. We invite you into our lives. And, Lord, we ask for your special grace, your anointing. I pray that you'd come and minister to each one in this room. Uh, Lord, I think of the own mercy that you did, the, the own broken era in my own life uh, just this week, and, and you just, just sent grace and 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 uh you have lifted my own countenance because of it and lord i just pray you'd lift my brother's countenance today i don't know if it's financial or if it's a job or if it's a marriage or lord maybe they just feel like a big loser i pray that you'd come and minister your power and your love and your goodness to him this day father and i i pray um Thank you for this ministry, Lord. I thank you for uh, Phil's giftedness, and I thank you for the the uh, the uh, support of the ceasefire. And Lord, I, I pray that you would be pleased to to heal us all of our cancer. We have we have uh, we have cancer of the heart and of the soul. And uh, Lord, we just want to live out our manhood in the way that we were designed to live. And Father, I pray that you would heal, and that your power and your agency and your desire, you are not grudgingly wanting to heal. You want to heal us. Would you come and would you heal the men in this room, Lord, and, and our families and our lives? And, and Lord, I think of this, uh, this gentleman, Tim Atkinson and his beautiful wife. I think of my buddy, uh, Max Yates and Karen, uh, Lord, uh, he's in the hospital even now with aggressive, uh, treatment to try to knock out this stuff. I pray you would would touch them, Lord. I, I pray you'd surround them with a, a beautiful network and a support life uh, line, Father. I pray, Lord, that uh, now more than ever, they would know of your nearness, your goodness, your power, and your strength. And Lord, uh, we also think of, of the Max's family, the Tullis's, and just um, pray that you, those, those kids, Lord, that are growing up uh, without Max, that you just bless them, Lord, and 
uh, we just ask today that you would in somehow intervene in their life and some of your relationship or uh, maybe uh, maybe there's some some uh, obstacle. Would you be gracious and would you uh, see fit to enter into that situation? And Lord, we just commit the day to you and, and I invite you to come here. Thank you for these men that have carved out time in their lives to come and to sit under the teaching of your word and to look for transformation uh, in not just information. And so, Lord, to that end, we pray and invite you to come and to do your work. And we ask it in the unparalleled name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The power of love. The power of love. We need to be loved and we need to love. It's transforming. It's addictive. Um, I love uh, the creativity and the imagination um, of men uh, that are under the power of God. And uh, I have a song for you that's from that great gospel group, U2. And uh, it's uh, pretty widely known uh, that uh, they are um, veiled Christians in the sense of kind of like Trojan horse. You, you roll them in and you're going to hear the gospel. They're great fans. Bono is a great fan of Eugene Peterson uh, and loves the Message Bible. Uh, I thought about even using the message this morning, even though I've gone to the New Living uh, for this series. But this song, um, Love, Rescue Me, is like listening to a gospel song. Um, you can hear it um, as a, a romantic song, a lover, uh, or you can hear it as a gospel song. When I hear this song, I hear it as a gospel song. I hear it as if God himself, um, and I'm in church, uh, is singing, um, Love, Rescue Me. That's what our uh, parable is about today is the lost sheep, 99 and 1, and the shepherd goes to find the one. I want you to listen to this song. Open your heart to love. Be aware of those that have loved you and have changed your life. Be aware of those that you need to love that are looking uh, for love, and certainly be aware of the love of Jesus in your heart. May you hear the voice of God. Love, rescue me.
Phillips was really carrying. <laughs> Good. All right. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Jesus comes to the last couple of weeks of his life, and he wants his disciples, his followers, to really remember. Remember, the Hebrew word that is the descriptive word for man is zakar, and it means the remembering one. And remembering is such a major theme throughout Scripture. Remember, remember, remember. And Jesus wanted his disciples to remember what he had taught. So he moves into a little bit different mode of teaching, and he starts to tell parables, 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 parables. There's over 46 parables that Jesus told stories to awaken the heart. Once upon a time, once upon a time, nothing captures our heart like a story. A man stands before you and tells his story. You remember that a whole lot more than any kind of didactic teaching, propositional teaching. Jesus knew that. And this morning, uh, we come to the parable of the lost sheep. I want you to pick up your pen and engage with me, and I have three questions before we dive into the parable. <clears throat> so much about love. First question that I want you to respond to is, who are you praying for? Who, who are you really concerned about right now? Certainly, I hope that in light of Joe's introduction that the Tullis family and uh, Tim Atkinson, um, that you would pray for them. Tim's in the battle of his life, pancreatic cancer. But who's in your life? There's not a man in this room that doesn't have people that you're concerned about. Um, love that person. How can you express, uh, express love to that person? One of my very bestest, bestest friends, good friend, um, sat with his son and had lunch with him. It had been months since they'd, since they'd sat together. And when my friend told me about his lunch with his son, there was a different energy that I've seen in my friend in months. Totally different energy a positive energy, a lightness. He's been through a lot. But just to sit with his son meant so much to him. And I would trust and hope that it was likewise with his son. Who are you concerned about? Second question that I would invite you to respond to is who cared about you when you were in need? Who has cared about you in that circumstance that, man, you just felt like you got your teeth kicked in. Who cared for you? Some of you may be going through that experience right now. Who's caring for you? Who cares for you? Who did care for you? <clears throat> Final question. Third question, what can you do to reach out to somebody today? What comes to your mind? Just allow the Lord to speak to you right now. What can you do to reach out in love to someone? Be mindful. Who does God bring to your mind? Oh, wow. I wasn't expecting that. I hear you, Lord. I hear you. Listen. Who can you love? Who can you love? I want you to turn over <clears throat> to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. It's, it's interesting. Uh, Jesus comes um, to um, this time in his life. He only has a, a couple of weeks before the crucifixion, before he dies on a cross. Um, you know, as Joe said, 
we will all die. Every man dies. But to be in a place to where you're facing death, whether it be through cancer or an illness, and somebody says, you've got nine months. With Jesus, he knew you've got two weeks. What would you do if you knew that you had two weeks to live? Jesus starts telling stories. And it's interesting, he tells three stories. And in a certain sense, we ought to be looking at all three of these stories today. We just don't have time, so we're going to look at one of the three. But Jesus tells three stories in this context. He tells the story of the lost sheep. There's 99 in one, and the shepherd goes to find the one. He tells the, the story of the lost coin, the widow who, who loses a coin, the lost coin. And then he tells the story of the lost son, the prodigal son, all right here. Three parables. Shepherd who leaves 99 to find one lost. Jesus was talking about the lost and wandering. He is illustrating a point to say, the lost and wandering I will go after. The parable of the lost coin, the woman searching everywhere for her lost coin, it's the idea of the image bearer, that we bear the image. It is the coin, and we're image bearers of God. And finally, he shares the father who ran the moment that he could see his lost son, and it's like our lost children, the lost son, that God loves us like a shepherd who goes after one sheep. He loves us like a woman who lo loses a coin and searches everywhere to find the one coin. He loves us like a father who has lost a son. These parables tell us of the nature of God who is searching and desiring more than anything to find his lost, wandering, image bearer of children, and then he throws a party. And then he throws a party. Lost sheep. What's called lost son. The context of this is not to be missed. Um, verse 3 is where we start that um, Jeff's got on the screen. But listen to verse 1, chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. And I forgot to include this, or Jeff would, would, would have this up on the screen. But listen to this. Verse 1 and 2 is not to be missed. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. They would be the guys who would slip in on the back row. The back row sitters. There we go. Craig's back there on the back row. All you back row. Johnny's back there. Glad to see you back rowers back there. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners, no doubt. Glad you're here. Welcome. Lawyers. Exactly. You got the lawyers. You're in the right place, Johnny. <laughs> This, now, this is interesting here. This made the religious guys, this made the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such despicable people. We've heard the word despicable recently, haven't we? It's right there. There's the despicables. Even eating with them, the religious people, it's like if they had their way, they would cut out those back row sitters, and it's like, we're not even going to have the back row. We used to have 10 rows. Now we have eight, you know, because row nine and 10, we just blocked off. We don't allow row nine and 10 anymore. Notorious sinners. Guys, there's probably no one in this room that at some point has felt so low that you felt like that God could not love you that what you did is so despicable. The shame was so high. You certainly couldn't share it. There's no place you could share that. And you wish that somehow you could take that part of you away.
because the message of that act, that sin, says that you're unlovable and you're unwantable. Gentlemen, that is the very message of Jesus that is contrary to the message of shame in you. He does love you. He does love the back row sitters. He, he does love the tax collectors and other notorious sinners. Gentlemen, my name is Phil Harden, and I'm a notorious sinner. How about you? Welcome, Jesus says. Welcome. Guys, only to the degree that we realize the intensity and the depth of our sin can we appreciate the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus. You can write that down. Only to the degree that we recognize, take ownership, and understand the depths of our sin and brokenness, can we appreciate and receive the depth of the love, grace, and forgiveness of Jesus. Now, I'm not going to repeat it a third time because I would say it a different way the third time. I can't say anything the same way twice, but you get the idea. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> way too much creativity in this crazy head of mine. So this is the story that Jesus tells. So Jesus used this illustration. And, and, and again, you know, keep in mind that, you know, these religious guys, they are so critical. They're so judgmental. They're so looking at Jesus as a rogue because he's hanging out with these notorious sinners. And, and, and Jesus, in, the, in that context, says, here, hold my wine and watch this. So Jesus used this illustration. If you had a hundred sheep and one of them strayed away and was lost in the wilderness, wouldn't you leave the 99 others to go and search for the lost one until you found it? Now, don't move away from that question too quick. Jesus asked that question, and the implication is, wouldn't you leave? But don't, but don't move too quickly through the implicit nature of that question. Would you really? Well, no, I got 99. Man, if I, if I leave the 99 and go through one, I come back and all the 99 are gone. I mean, you and I, as sheep herders, we'd be weighing whether or not we could do that. Jesus says, by implication, what he's getting at is that God doesn't hesitate. He goes after the back rowers, after the back rowers. <laughs> now, I'm going to share something here that uh, I guess it's okay to share in public, you know. I'm too old to, to be worried about a whole lot of stuff anymore. <laughs> I, was, um, I was a director of men's ministry at a prominent church several years ago, and um uh, when I got there, um, um, it was amazed that they hired me. I, I was thinking, man, they don't even know who I am. I could be an axe murderer. But they hired me, and um, they wanted me to work with their men. And when I got there, um, I asked uh, the educational director to bring the role of all the men to my office. And I remember there was 933 men a pretty significant group. And I said, we're going to divide these men into three categories. And we sat there and we went through all 933 men. Jeff Rickles was on that list. <clears throat> and I'm not going to tell you which category Jeff was in. Uh, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> and I said, the A's will we'll, we'll have A, B, and C groups. The A's will be guys who are in a definitive uh, role of leadership. Uh, they're elders, they're deacons, they're committee heads. So they'll be the A guys, that they're in a position of leadership. The B's will be the younger guys who in the next five years or so will be 
in those stated roles. It's easy to see that they're being groomed, they're on that path, and in a few years, they will be the new deacons and the elders. The C's would be the guys who are probably not going to be leaders uh, by position in the church, and they tend to sit on the back row and come in. Um, you know how many guys were on that C list? There were over 400 guys. Uh, and I said, that's our men's ministry right there. And I stood before the leaders, and I told them, uh, and it was the, the way they made it this is, this kind of makes me laugh because it's kind of like sitting in the Sanhedrin. It's this, this, it's this kind of auditorium thing. And, uh, and, I, and, and, and I stood before them and I said, I have a list of C's, the C group. And that's who I'm targeted on. And I don't really care if I see you guys at all. You know, I'll wave at you, but I'm not looking um, to minister to you. I'm looking to minister to the C guys. To the, to the tax collectors and the notorious sinners. Gentlemen, that's what God is telling us. That's what Jesus is telling us through this story. It's like, I'm not after the guys who are all dressed up and don't have a problem. I'm after the guys who are broken. I love broken people. I love that sheep who is lost, and I'll even risk losing the 99 to go after you. you. You have never sinned. You cannot sin. You have never committed anything that is beyond the stretch of God's loving arm. Impossible. Shame will tell you otherwise. Your wife might even tell you otherwise. Your friend may even tell you otherwise. Get a new friend. <clears throat> and then you would joyfully carry it home on your shoulders. When you arrived, you would call together your friends and neighbors to rejoice with you because your lost sheep was found. In the same way, heaven will be happier over one lost sinner who returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. Guys, we just don't grasp the nature of that last phrase. All of heaven rejoices over that one lost. You, you, in the midst of your brokenness, failure, in your most shameful moment, in your most discouraged moment, in the biggest mistake of your life, Jesus says, I'm here. He does not reject. He does not turn his back. When guys come to deer camp, <clears throat> they are invited into a safe environment. Grace and love is flooding them as best we know how to give it. But every man who comes, who gets the idea that on some level he's going to be able to reveal his brokenness, is afraid of one thing. What is he afraid of? He's afraid of rejection. He's afraid that when he opens his mouth, that we'll look at him and like, you did what? You did that. And everybody runs for his car and leaves the guy sitting there by himself. That's the fear that we all have. JW, that didn't happen with you, did it? Came close. Came close. We thought about it. Uh, you got the look. No, never happened, nor will it happen. See, guys, here's, here's the deal. Hit that first teaching slide. We're finally to that point. <clears throat> the stories that Jesus offers over and over and over are stories of restoration. It's the idea of a great need that we all have being met. The love of God, how great the love of God, especially for those who have a great need for love, the lost, the frightened, the soil, the losers, the failures of this world, the broken. 
And yet, what the Pharisees and religious guys were doing is they were saying God hates sinners. That those back rowers, those tax collectors, and those notorious sinners don't belong. Quite the contrary. Quite the contrary. Questions from this parable. How does God feel about you and all your brokenness? As you consider how bad you are, gentlemen, you are actually worse than you feel, even when you feel bad. Keep that in mind. As bad as you feel and as ashamed as you are in the midst of your sin, you're actually worse because you have no hope. And yet 1 Timothy 1, 15 says this, This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. Guys, if we all had the freedom to be able to claim, as Paul did, I am the worst of sinners, rather than saying, you know, I'm not as bad as that guy. Dude, that that crazy stuff will send you to hell experientially. You start doing that comparison thing, it's not going to work out well for you. I'm not as bad as that guy. I'm worse than that guy. It's, the point is, you're the worst. You are the worst. And if somebody says, man, I heard you did that, and, and how could you show up on Thursday morning at men's roundtable? Dude, what you ought to say is, well, you know, you're right. I am that bad, and I'm actually worse than what you think I am. Have that freedom. How many people in the world are broken? Just like the movie that, um, does it open tonight or did it open last night? Same kind of different as me. Is it tonight? Go see it. But it's like same kind of different as me. You know, my Daughter wrote a book, you know, look at me, I'm just like you. Just like you. We're all sinners. How does God feel about broken mankind? This idea of love. <clears throat> Romans 3.23 says, For everyone has sinned, and we all fall sh- short of God's glorious standard. Every man, there's, there's no grading on the curve. Every man is lost. And yet Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, for the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. You can't earn it. The gospel is that you're worse than you think, and Jesus is more than you can imagine. That's the gospel. You're worse than you think. And Jesus is more than you could ever imagine. Romans 5, 8, I love. But God showed his great love for Phil Harden by sending Christ to die for him while he was still in his sin. Personalize that. The great love of God. Love rescued me. What kind of God is out there? the kind of God that is a God of grace. And that's what Jesus was trying to tell these religious guys. Guys, it's not about the religious guys that I'm after. It's about the guys who sit on the back row. It's the C guys. I want to show you... um, a clip out of uh, the world's greatest generation, Desmond Doss. Many of you know him as the uh, star of the true story, Hacksaw Ridge, the, uh, the movie. Desmond Doss is a picture of the shepherd who goes after the lost sheep, a real life example of a story that somehow captures this idea 
that I'm going to go and love and rescue those who can't help themselves. Watch this. My dad bought this Ten Commandments in Lois Pratt Illustrated on a, a nice frame. And I had looked at that picture of the Sixth Commandment, Thou shalt not kill. That's the picture had Cain had killed his brother Abel. Now what how in the world could a brother do such a thing? I've pictured Christ of saving life. I want to be like Christ. I was saving life instead of taking life. And that's the reason I take up medicine. Desmond Doss was drafted into the Army in April 1942. He wanted to serve his country, but electing not to bear arms, the Virginia native instead joined the Army Medical Corps. Assigned to the U.S. invasion of Okinawa, where deeply entrenched Japanese forces hammered American troops from caves and tunnels, Doss and his battalion were ordered to assault a jagged 400-foot escarpment overrun with Japanese defenders. Japanese had been there for years. They had that mountain on a cone and camouflage to look like natural terrain. And that's what we had to face. So I remember eight or nine of those Japanese positions we destroyed before we contacted A Company. And when the day was done, I didn't have a single man killed. The next day, we thought the big job was done, but instead, everything we were trying to stay went wrong. We threw hell, all types of high explosion demolition on the Japanese position. We decided it was only one thing left to do. We had 35 gallons of hard can gasoline and five gallon army water cans. Two men cut a hose, opened the can, let it up. Two of them literally threw it over the bank. Ammunition dump must have gone off. The whole mountain just seemed to clear. You can take anything, it was static. But to our surprise, out came these Japanese from both sides for us. Showering Doss's battalion with artillery, mortar, and machine gun fire, the Japanese drove the majority of the group back down the face of the escarpment. But dozens of casualties were still left behind. I had these men up there, and I should leave them. They were my buddies. Some of my men were families, and they trusted me. I didn't feel like I should value my life above my buddies. So I decided to stay with them and take care of as many of them as I could. I didn't know how I was going to do it. Doss remained to tend the wounded, dragging them to the cliff's edge and attempting to lower them down the escarpment but I didn't have enough rope to do the job like it should be done. Then the Lord brought to my mind that not I learned in West Virginia I'd never seen or heard of before. Relying on his childhood experience rescuing flood victims, Doss fashioned a special sling that enabled him to lure the men one by one to safety. So I just kept praying, Lord, please help me get one more, one more until there was nine left, and I was the last one down. By nightfall, he had managed to rescue 75 fallen comrades. It was 15 I was got the middle of that day. When my time came, I went up. Present to a man, he came up, and he stepped over the line of covered by my hand. 
shook my hand like an old time friend, somebody he'd been knowing all his life. He didn't even give me a chance to get nervous. <laughs> when you had explosions and bullets so close you could pack a favorite and not get wounded up there when I should have been killed a number of times. I know who I owe my life to as well as my men. That's why I like to tell this story to the glory of God because I know from the human standpoint I should not be here. You can't always win. But when your buddies come to you and say they owe their life to me, what better reward can you get than that? One more. One more. One lost sheep. Jesus' love, God's love is so powerful that if you were that one, one more. I'll show you this final clip and we'll close. Out of the movie Hacksaw Ridge, Desmond Doss, such a picture of this parable going after the lost sheep. One more. Watch this. Good. Okay, we got you. We got you. It's me, it's Desmond. I gotta fix you up. You ready to get out of here? Sure am. Please, Lord, help me get one more. Help me get one more. Let me get one more. Great, great love of God. One more. Every man in this room has people in your life that needs to experience the love of God. The notorious sinners, people that don't deserve to be loved, people who have hurt you, people that you would even call enemies. And Jesus said the way that we would show the world that he is in us and has redeemed us is through our love for others. One more. One more. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your great love, uh, love that we don't deserve. We're all back row sitters. We are notorious sinners. Father, thank you for uh, bringing your love, uh, wiping out shame from us. And Father, I especially pray for men who are dealing with shame this morning that they would put themselves in a transformative, radical place of acceptance of men who can love them and be Jesus with skin on it to bring healing to their hearts, to not be ashamed anymore so that they might too 
love others in a healing way and be an instrument of your love for so many others around them. Thank you, Father, for our time. We love you. Thanks for loving us in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week.